my name is Kornel Kishelevich. I represent, no, actually, I'm the only person that is in Chaos Forge Limited. I know it sounds so big, Chaos Forge, but it's basically a one man show. Uh, and I'm developing, I'm an indie roguelike developer. How many of you have heard the term roguelike? Hell yes. It will be a lot easier now to talk. So, because just in case, I wanted to have a slide with a typical roguelike. Uh, another question. How many of you know how roguelikes look in ASCII? Oh, uh, yeah, that's the problem. Never mind. Uh, the, uh, the point just is that roguelikes are basically all derived from a game that was it's, it's 30, 40, 30 years old, which was made on a text terminal and used uh, text characters like hash to show walls or the extended character set to show walls and the at sign like in the email was always the character and for the last 30 years except for the last four years uh, they stayed that way people did develop roguelikes they were ASCII uh, there were many many roguelikes that were quite popular like Adam, NetHack, Angband and suddenly, around four years ago, uh, when the term was only known to geeks and hackers, uh, suddenly the indie scene picked it up. Unfortunately, almost none of the games that were made were actually roguelikes, in the sense that it was used for the past 30 years. So let's, but first, uh, because somebody next time told me that I actually didn't. Uh, tell what I personally did. So I'm probably most known for a roguelike game It's called Doom RL Which basically is taking Doom. Yeah, that Doom the old ID software game and turning it into a top-down turn-based permadeath uh, role-playing game So uh, the game was started as a joke But the joke went too far. I mean I released it and suddenly I see it in printed magazines <laughs> So Rock Paper Shotgun wrote a nice thing about it. It wrote, it was written in 11 days, and that's true, and then it was updated for 12 years. So that's an interesting life cycle. But obviously, the game is free, because uh, last time I checked, I don't own the Doom IP. Luckily, luckily they like me, so, so, so the game is still available for download. Just search Doom the Roguelike. You can download it and play on PC Mac Linux. Shameless ad plug. Uh, but let's talk about roguelikes. So uh, to talk about uh, roguelikes, we have to ask ourselves, what is a roguelike? Yeah, that's a simple question. Uh, because currently new roguelike games appeared, uh, the old timers, the people that wrote those old roguelikes for the last 30 years, they gathered together on a, something called the International Roguelike Conference and decided that we need a definition, right? Because we were the most... Uh, as people who were developing roguelikes for the past uh, 20 years, we were the ones that had the right to decide what actually a roguelike is. So we needed a really simple definition, and we came up with a uh, simple definition. Simple. That's about as simple as they could get it. So basically, yeah, it's called the Berlin interpretation. That sounds like so awesome. Uh, basically, we have high value factors, which makes a thing like a lot more roguelike. We have low value factors and about with the high value factors we have random environments, permadeath, turn, grid based, non-model, complexity, resource management, hacked slash and exploration, low value, blah. Never mind. Very simple definition. Just by looking at it we can say that for example, Tetris is a roguelike. It's got a random environment, it's permadeath, it's grid based, it's non-model, well complexity a little bit less, no resource management, but we've got four high value factors. Tetris is a roguelike. Well, spoiler alert, it isn't. Uh, so obviously, mm, the definition is broken. But on the other hand, uh, what we all did agree is the fact that the games that are right now released and said they are roguelikes, they are most often roguelike likes. The problem uh, appears when you get Spelunky, which is a roguelike like, and compared to FTL, it seems that FTL is a roguelike like like. Because it's somehow similar, it has the same elements, and 
yeah. So basically, there's a big pile of shit when it comes to the definition of roguelikes. So instead of trying to, to define roguelikes, what I think, yeah, another term suggested was roguelites. But that's hard to pronounce, roguelites. So current interpretations are loose, so let's basically screw it for a moment and concentrate on what makes roguelikes fun. Because definitions are not fun. So there are three defining factors that I managed to, to distill from roguelikes. And unfortunately, those three defining factors appear in many games together, which wouldn't be considered roguelikes, so they aren't definitions, but they allow a much better understanding of why there are some crazy people who play ASCII games in 2015. Yes, there are many people who play ASCII games in 2015, despite the fact that you could, for example, play Call of Duty, which is much more uh, intimate. Good luck. Much more something, yeah. Oh, it, it can be multiplayer. No? Okay, never mind. Uh, so, permadeath. Uh, everybody knows what a permadeath is? Basically, it means that when uh, your character dies, you start fresh. When you save, you exit the game. So, basically, you've got one life. And uh, let's notice that it's, despite the fact that the term has appeared right now, uh, it's not so unique. I mean, all the arcades were permadeath where you bought a life for one coin or a couple of lives. Uh, all old games on, co on computers like C64, who owned the C64? Oh, there are a couple of old timers. So yeah, you remember, most of those games didn't have saves. Sometimes they had some kind of codes, but basically they were permadeath. And many of us, old timers feel that those games uh, provided us with a lot more emotion than the games that we play today. Mostly everybody says that it's just nostalgia, that you were young and you had a lot of emotions and right now everything that was before is so much better because nostalgia. But that's not completely true. Permadeath was one of the reasons because uh, right now if you play a game, when do you feel endangered? Uh, I'm, we're talking single-player games right now. What's the danger if in fighting even an epic boss battle if you just press F5, F9, quick save, quick load, and again, and again, and again? The emotions that the game's supposed to do, or for example, you have a big moral choice, and you have to do A or B. You do A and don't like the results. Okay, let's load and do B. So where's, where's that moral choice? Where's that feeling of that sh what you're doing actually counts for something? In permadev games, many roguelikes having even a playtime of over 24 hours for a single session, once up, you come to the point where you are faced with a decision whether to enter somewhere where you can get something but it's dangerous, many times you won't. In most of the games that you play, when you are faced with a difficult situation, you will enter and just see. If you die, die repeatedly, then you go somewhere else, come back. That's no problem. That's no decision. There's no fear in that. In roguelike games, especially in a character that you've invested into like a couple of hours, you start to feel fear of what you're doing. There's a funny story about that. Uh, when Doom RL, which is now graphic, graphical thanks to Derek CU tiles, when Doom RL was still ASCII, uh, the most dangerous enemy out there was the Arc Vile from Doom 2 uh, because it resurrected enemies and had an attack that you could not dodge. Uh, and it was a yellow V. So on the forums of Doom RL, there were threads about fear the yellow V. People were typing things like, I, I, I slept and suddenly I saw that yellow V. That yellow V brought many people's more horrors than even the best rendered uh, dragon from Skyrim or the best monster from, from Gears of War or, or, or stuff like that, just because it was really fearful. You could really die. You could lose hours of your game time just because you saw that yellow V. So, uh, yeah, when it comes to roguelikes, if, it's, if it doesn't have permadeath, sorry, you can talk all you want, but I won't call it a roguelike. That's like the most definable feature. And as I told, it's not so unique because old games did have them.
Another thing, some of you may argue that, for example, Diablo 3 has a hardcore mode, or other games have Iron Man mode, or there are games that you, uh, by yourself, can say that I will play it just on one life, and that's okay. But that's not permadeath. Because permadeath means that the game has to be designed from ground up so that a normal player can still play it and still uh, have at least hints how to avoid death or how to uh, react to situations that would kill him immediately. Obviously, Diablo 3 doesn't have a problem because there aren't many situation, insta-kill situations. But for example, if somebody is trying to... Uh, if somebody's trying to play Dark Souls on one life, <laughs> well, obviously that would make for a really bad permadeath game. Yes, I know. <laughs> Fear them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and the second thing is uh, that, uh, okay, most MMOs, due to the fact that they are online, are also technically permadev, because if you die, you die. You cannot load your progress, right? But they do everything. Everything just to make the player, you know, not feel dying. It's, it's like 10% of your gold, or you have to fix your items. So, yeah, there is a setback, but it's a little one. Don't, don't feel bad. Uh, and the third, uh, and the thing about, okay, there's one, one good game in that regard, and it's EVE Online. If you die in EVE Online, you will feel the pain. So, so that was, that, that's a permanent, it's just a roadblock. But, uh, so obviously, if the emotions are real, if everything is so awesome with permanent games, uh, why isn't the gold, well, isn't it the golden bullet? Why not make every game permanent? Well, when you start to imagine it, you immediately see the result. I'm not willing to start the game, have the long dialogue again, to go fetch that uh, chalice again, get that sword again. All the dialogues are the same. It would be boring as hell for most games. Some of them are, you know, less focused on story, but each game that has any kind of story will get really annoying really soon if you have to repeat it and repeat it again. So basically, Permadev doesn't work without the second feature of roguelikes, mainly randomness. OK, uh, randomness is such a broad topic, from random uh, dungeon generation, random planet construction, procedural objects, random quest generation. Oh my god, those are all awesome subjects. And the benefits obviously are widely accepted if the game is random and is not boring random, which most of the random games are. Uh, if the randomness is done well, it adds a lot to uh, playability because obviously when you start the game again you will have a different challenge, different situation, so it won't be boring. And obviously randomness is a requirement for permadeath because you don't want to die and do the same things again and again and again. But as told, uh, implementation right now is lacking. It's only now that uh, indies uh, already uh, encompass randomness and there are, there are many games that are have random elements and they're usually called the roguelike legs. Uh, but AAA games, not much so. Mostly, I think that the main example would be Diablo, which has random, uh, it has random areas, but I only notice it after a, a longer time because they all generate almost the same. And obviously it has random item drops, which other games have, like Borderlands. So they want to do it. They want randomness, but they're really afraid of it. And why? I'll tell in a minute. So, okay, those are two things, permadeath and randomness. Is that already a roguelike? So here's the thing, that's a roguelite, or roguelike light. Man, I'm going to talk weird after this talk. <laughs> so what actually sets those old roguelikes apart? And that, in my opinion, is the third defining factor. It's emergent complexity. So what's emergent complexity? If you have a lot of design uh, rules, a lot of uh, environment, for example, uh, ways to interact with the environment, and put a lot of them together, you suddenly start to get interactions, which sometimes are even different than what you planned. If 
simple example, let's spill some water on the dungeon floor and then uh, fire a bolt of electricity. In most games, it would make no result, but for example, in the roguelikes, all the people that are on the floor were going to get electrocuted. Actually, Quake 1 still had that, if I remember correctly, that if you would fire the lightning gun into the water, the guy in the water would die. But I'm not sure. So, that's a little bit of emergent complexity, but basically, uh, it's either dungeon generation, loot generation, that means when items start interacting with each other, the environment or the AI, many complex rules of the AI, when, when you get enough complexity, it will start doing things that you don't, uh, you haven't planned for. It actually happened to me when doing Doom RL, when I, in the beginning, all the monsters could actually pick up all the items, and I implemented the BFG, the big fucking gun. So, uh, but I didn't think about it, that all the monsters could pick up items. So I was extremely surprised when the former human picked up my BFG that I left on the floor and fried me with it. <laughs> that was actually fun the first time. <laughs> yeah, I changed it so they can't do that, so don't worry. So basically what we have here is a sum of parts, a multiplication of random var variables. Most of the games that have randomness right now, I don't have a blackboard, don't I? Nah. Uh, if you, but anyone who understands basic mathematics knows that if you have a choice, one, two, three, and then no matter of the choice, you have another choice, one, two, three, you have basically six or somewhat amount of situations, but if it gets branching, if you start, you know, doing uh, crap, I don't know mathematical words. <laughs> but basically, you're starting to multiply. The more variable choices you have, the uh, the amount of situations you can come up with multiplies. But okay, this is not about emergent complexity, actually. Uh, but about emergency complexity in the roguelike uh, approach. So one of the most important things is that in most roguelike games, in most roguelike games that I saw during those 30 years, the emergent complexity was never created by design. It's not that somebody, you know, sat down at a chair and said, we will have this and this and this, this will interact with this, this will interact with this. No, it was more like a shotgun coding. Let's do, let's implement this, and now let's implement this. Oh my god, this does interact. At some point, it reached a critical mass that it's so much fun, to watch all those little things interact. Uh, I'll leave it. Next slide. So basically, what we did was experimentation, discovery. It was feeling like we, we throw things at the game and get surprised what the game does, which obviously, right now, no AAA developer has that feeling of throwing random interactions into the game and seeing how they respond. No, they first design it, then implement it. Either it's implemented good or it's implemented bad. So they never have the holy grail, the situation where the game developer runs his game and the game itself surprises him, like that BFG example uh, before. So emergent complexity is obviously not present only in roguelikes because it's a good thing, right? Uh, right? So now it's. Uh, mid rand. Uh, there's been a really troubling trend that I've observed right now. It's a trend of having, uh, among indies, one core mechanic that defines the whole game. Uh, even more, it's on different talks, like the talk by uh, Brenda Romero, which I uh, really actually liked. Uh, but one of the elements in her talk was that uh, making games is like making sushi. So you want to put the player in an extremely controlled environment where everything is perfect. Every detail of the scene must be perfect, and it's like a small, one-core mechanic world. And that sounded really bad to me. I mean, uh, it's, it's, I mean, my company's name is Chaos Forge. How can I be in a controlled environment, and what fun is that? If you're not having fun doing games, it's obviously you're doing something wrong, or you shouldn't be a game developer. So basically, that cult of simplicity uh, uh, made a few uh, problems. Like, for example, there was a game called Legends of Eisenwald. You can look it up. It was a classic RPG-style 
it was quite complex, but you basically had with non indie graphics, but with like lo fi characters walking around the a, a typical RPG world, which was complex, which had complex uh, dialogues. And it was uh, submitted to Indicate, and they got an, uh, a reply that it's not indie enough. So, considering that at that Indicate, most of the games were uh, platformers, we could see a troubling trend. It's not a <laughs> if it's not a pixel art platformer, it can't be novel. Anybody, anybody know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. So, but still, it's art, right? We're, 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 we want indie games to be art, and we always talk about it. So, if if indie games are simple one-core mechanic things. It's art because a uh, red triangle on a white square is also art, right? I dare you submit that to App Store. <laughs> so it's but but it's a problem just in the in the, in the industry, right? Because in AAA we have complex games which are very non one uh, one mechanic things. So. Now, a word about gameplay. Let's talk about Roblox again. Uh, anybody played Diablo 1? Yeah. So, uh, as a part of a seven day roguelike challenge, about. It was seven years ago, I think. Uh, so the seven day roguelike challenge is writing a roguelike game in seven days. They usually wrote it from scratch because we didn't have awesome engines back then. Uh, I took upon myself to, uh, because Diablo 1 was fully uh, reverse engineered. Some guy took all the stats from the code, all the roles from the code, and published a, something that is called Gerald's Bible, which has basically all the mechanics stripped from the game with all the tables, all the roles, all the way the system, the, the timing system works. So it was basically fully reverse engineered. So during those three day, seven days, uh, I made Diablo RL which is a completely faithful reinterpretation of every single rule in the book with two differences. First, it's ASCII, like above. Yeah, we've got those globes here, see? <laughs> uh, first, it's ASCII, and secondly, it's turn-based. Oh, and it's permadeath, obviously. Uh, but all of the stats, all of the way the items are rolled, everything up to the single detail is fully compliant with Diablo. So basically, what I found out that moment was that Diablo, hey, I had to obviously also program the engine, program the graphics, program things like that, but basically there's no more than seven days of gameplay programming in Diablo 1. And let me tell you, Diablo is actually a complex game compared to others. So let's have another word about gameplay. Now let's have a story about two games that were released the same year. Game A had a highly praised story, had memorable NPCs that were loved by the community, some with, with fans doing fan art, stuff like that. It had solid voice acting. It had lovable companions for the main player. Yes, we're talking about RPGs. And it was pretty damn polished. Game B, in the same year, had a lousy story, which could not be there and be OK, had cringeworthy NPCs, <laughs> really, really crappy voice acting, forgettable companions, and it was extremely buggy. I think, okay, how many people know which, what two games those are? Wow, nobody? One got Metacritic 89, was nominated for several, uh, was, got several uh, Game of the Year, Awards. The other had a Metacritic 94, had several uh, Game of the Year editions. Do you see something wrong with this picture? <laughs> Mass Effect 3 and Skyrim. Did I did I write it well? Do you agree with the with the facts? <laughs> so, Skyrim is a bad game, and and only the critics wrote good stuff, right? Uh, well, I, I, I think I, I, I should not 
say <laughs> that that it is a bad game. Actually, it was my my absolute favorite game of the last decade. So, uh, what's the point? Uh, Skyrim, yes, it was extremely buggy. It had many problems, many issues, crappy voice acting, but it gave people something that the other game didn't. It gave them freedom of exploration. It was complex. It had bugs, obviously, and to be honest, the first time I saw a skeleton dragon flying, I thought, whoa, what an awesome feature. And afterwards I learned it was a bug. <laughs> That's some kind of an emergent complexity also. So basically, if you're doing a game that has much freedom, if you're doing a game that has much complex mechanism, and compared to other AAA games, Skyrim definitely did that. Obviously, uh, not on the level that some roguelikes do, but uh, it was pretty damn complex in its basic mechanics, which actually worked uh, all in parallel. It wasn't like you're following a storyline that you can plan exactly like uh, was told before that uh, we have a controlled environment. No, we don't have any controlled environment. Let's allow the player to do what he really wants. And that's the reason why, despite being so bad in comparison, Skyrim was, was the game of the year or game of decade for many, many players. Because, to be honest, if you're doing complex stuff, there will be bugs. There will be bugs, and there will be bugs after release, and even hundreds of hours of playtesting won't find every damn bug in a game which has so much complexity. So it's okay if your game is buggy. I will still love it. Well, unless it's Assassin's Creed, which, which was extremely, you know, uh, detailed and it could, people could catch that, but they still didn't. That's, that's a no-no. So, but, uh, let's talk for a moment about uh, complexity by design, uh, or actually, no, we won't have time for the other slide. Okay, let's, let's go forward. Uh. So right now, after what I said, uh, what can we say? Okay, I'll ask that again. Who played Dwarf Fortress? Like, who played the Dwarf Fortress? <laughs> like, who played Dwarf Fortress for more than a year in game? <laughs> you guys are lying. <laughs> uh, okay, so Dwarf Fortress is like the most fucking ultimate example of emergent complexity. There are so many deep systems that I promise you no other game, no other game by any AA publisher is, is, is as complex, even No Man's Sky, is as complex as Dwarf Fortress is inside. But the point is, the developer, whom I really like, uh, just, okay, but the interface to that game, it actually, there was, I think, a, a, a book even published, Dwarf Fortress for Dummies. So basically, trying to learn the interface, it screams to you, get the hell out of here, each time you watch it. So, the game is extremely complex. So why, what, what happens? Why, why, why isn't this game a lot more popular? Everybody talks about Dwarf Fortress, nobody plays it. Just because the author doesn't give a fuck, actually, about what you think. He makes this game for himself, and I love him because of that. And thanks to that, he makes the most awesomely complex and emergent design ever. The amount of interactions is beautiful. So everybody basically writes about it, nobody plays it, and that's fine. On the other side, let's step a little bit up. We've got Minecraft. Minecraft has obviously some... Uh, emergent uh, complexity. Well, the best deal is here you can actually make a hard drive in Minecraft. Everybody knows that. But it's a little bit more approachable by the average player. And yes, that's also a sample of emergent complexity. And Skyrim is an AAA example. So basically, these three games, despite being totally different in terms of budget, 
uh, are a sample of that which I think that is missing right now in the gaming industry. Because uh, let's ask ourselves a question. We've got those extremely powerful CPUs. Uh, what do we use them in computer games? Do we use them to make interesting, complex gameplay? No, we use them to generate blood splatter. Because it looks good on the wall, right? And with all those CPU resources where now we could actually start doing really, really complex stuff like Dwarf Fortress but with a nicer UI, right now we're wasting them to, to do blood splatter, to do, uh, what's the like, biggest trend right now in the shooters? Mm, yeah, grass that, that deforms when you walk over it or trees. Yeah, it's all, it's all bloom. Yeah, okay. So... <laughs> So we've got all those, you know, awesome graphics features, but but nobody uses the CPU actually to 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 do something cool anymore. So, uh, right now, probably Skyrim and a couple of other indies, and maybe another AAA game that I forgot to mention, are some games that try to have that complex design. But it seems that each year we have less and less of such games. So my question is: Is there a danger that we actually will have them go away completely. Like if uh, if the Elder Scrolls, and I'm not talking about the horrible Elder Scrolls online here, if the Elder Scrolls goes away as a single player and everybody is scared about that, will we have open world role playing games anymore? And don't even get me started on Dragon Age 3. It's open world, but it plays more like a massive multiplayer than Skyrim. So, because I was ranting, right now I have to make an apology. Simple, one mechanic games are awesome. And I played a lot of those, and they come out of game jams, and sometimes they are brilliant. And it's really cool. And it's really cool to play such games for a few hours. Obviously, quite often, unless they are a puzzle game, quite often they have a low replayability value. But what I really want Okay, Unity Effect was something that I talked already on the rant, so I'm not going to get into that again. Uh, but I wanted to make a note. The War Fortress will probably still be played in 30 years. The same way as uh, the old roguelikes like NetHack are still being played by guys in the computer rooms. But most of the games right now that we have will be forgotten. And War Fortress might have a still big player base, and I'm really scared to think what the guy will come up with next. But these people are underrepresented and basically treated like freaks right now in the industry. If you're trying to do uh, your own engine and do complex mechanics, write them, try to do emergent design, you're probably not going to cons be considered indie because you don't have retro pixel graphics. So now the uh, mandatory, obvious, shameless self plug. So we as Chaos Forge right now, are trying to do exactly that because we have got so many rogue lights, the rogue light, rogue like like likes on the market uh, that if people ask you what's actually a real rogue like, you barely have anything you can point them to and say play this. You can uh, eventually you can point them play this, but first read this manual. That won't work. So basically what I want to do is actually make a roguelike that's accessible for a player but still doesn't lose those three major elements. Doesn't lose permadeath, doesn't lose randomness, and doesn't lose uh, complexity. So yeah, I think I did the closing words already. Questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do you only count RPG games as roguelikes? RPG games, or is Dwarf Fortress also a, a roguelike? Uh, I actually consider Dwarf Fortress a roguelike, which the author either, even doesn't consider as a roguelike much. <laughs> so okay. yeah, thank you.
how much randomness is enough? <laughs> because, you know, you can have random worlds, but in order to construct a random world, you need patterns. So you can't have completely randomized world without seeing some patterns in it. Uh, patterns, pat patterns. Well, uh, obviously, whether you see patterns or not depends on the algorithm. If you can get something extremely, uh, because yes, you will see patterns, but uh, if, if your project is enough random, those patterns will appear like the guy will see the same uh, design pattern after uh, 1,275 years of play, if, if the algorithm is complex enough. Right, there will be all these patterns, but the question is how deep is your algorithm? So, and uh, in terms of your question, uh, how much randomness is enough? Well, obviously, the joke answer would be there's never enough randomness. But uh, the more serious uh, answer would be as much randomness as you can fit in and still have interest in gameplay. And that's something that most of the people that implement randomness in their games forget. If you make a random level generator and the random level generator is far inferior to a uh, handmade level, you're doing it wrong. Too many times we see randomly generated levels that are boring and have nothing in them and are obviously, like for example, a game has both random levels and pre-constructed levels, right? And if the pre-constructed levels stand out so much that you only are waiting till you get to the pre-constructed and the, all the others are boring, that means that you probably should have done all the levels uh, non-random instead. So as much as you put work into it, you have to find the moment where too much randomness starts making the game boring instead of fun and exciting and different at every time. Okay, I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions. Thank you very much.